Ja, hey. Mark Charles in the Sin the cave in the slip, the toy of William Bush's chain. Sin the cave in the Bush's chain, the toy of cheating Bush and all that. So, in the Navajo culture, we're a matrilineal um, people. So, our identities come from our mother's mother. And so, when I introduce myself, I say, Sin the cave in the slip, which means the wooden shoe people are my mother's people. Um, my second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the water that flow together people. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sinbuke Inan. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Tohichini. That's the Bitterwater clan, one of the original clans of our Navajo tribe. Um, tonight, our session is called What We Don't Talk About. And as Americans, we actually have a massively long list of things we don't talk about. Um, I'm going to present a good portion of that list to you tonight. And I have to warn you before we get started, some of what we're going to talk about tonight is going to make you angry. Some of it is going to uh, make you uncomfortable. Some of it is going to maybe want to make you stand up and walk out. Some of it may even want to make you want to throw something at me. I encourage you on all counts, don't follow those impulses. <laughs> um, but stay in the dialogue, stay in the conversation. We will get to a better place, but we have to first deal with this list of things that as a nation, we've kind of collectively decided we're not going to talk about them. Primarily through practice. Just we, we don't have a practice of talking about these things. So one of the first things, and I'm going to start with the most recent events that we don't talk about is people like Terrence Crutcher. We don't know how to talk about that. Person who is pulled over and shot. We don't know how to talk about that. We don't know how to talk about Keith Lamont Scott. Again, a person sitting in his car and killed by one of our law enforcement officers. We don't know how to talk about things like this. We don't know how to talk about Colin Kaepernick, a highly, very talented football player who, when he hears the national anthem before a football game, he refuses to stand up and respectfully bend down on his knee in protest against a song about a nation that has hurt and enslaved and continues to oppress his people. We don't know how to talk about these things. We also don't know how to talk about the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, and the Creek people. Is there anyone from any of these tribes here tonight? Anyone from one of these tribes who's here tonight? These are the tribes that were ethnically cleansed from the land we're sitting on today. These were the tribes that were rounded up during the Trail of Tears, and they were marched to more empty lands further in the, in the west from here. As a nation, we don't know how to talk about these things. We don't know how to talk about the people who lived here before the settlers and the nation colonized this, this land. So, I would like to start, wherever I go, I'd like to honor the people who were here before us. So I would like to start just, um, if we could just have a moment of silence. Not that these people are gone, not that they're dead, not that they're no longer here. They've just been moved. They, they now have been moved somewhere else. They have a reservation elsewhere in this country. And I just want to, to in, as a show of honor and respect to the people who were here before this city was founded, the people who were here before this university was founded, I'd like us just to stand in silence for a moment. If everyone can stand in silence for a moment. 
Again, not that these people are gone, not that they're dead, but this is a way for us to just show respect to the people who were here for, before uh, the United States of America and European nations colonized this continent. I also just want us to take a moment of silence to remember these names and other names. Thank you, you can have a seat. Now there's a reason we don't talk about these things. And most of these things that I just put up in front of you have to do with race. It has to do with, with the, the way that our nation, that our country has constructed this, this way of categorizing people that we call race. And this actually goes back to some pimple bulls written in the 1400s. So in 1452, Pope Nicholas V wrote down these words. Invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and convert them to his and their use and profit. This is the first in a series of papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493 that collectively became known as what are called the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is a series of papal bulls that is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by Christian rulers, those people are less than human and the lands yours for the taking. This was the doctrine that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the African people because they weren't fully human. This is also the doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in a continent already inhabited by millions and claim to have discovered it. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands that are already inhabited. That's called stealing, right? Conquering, colonizing. If you don't believe me, put your laptops, your car keys in front of you. I'll come by and discover them for you. The fact that to this day we refer to what Columbus did as discovery reveals the implicit racial bias of our country which is native peoples are not fully human. This, of course, makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically racist doctrine that assumes the dehumanization of people of color. In 1763, King George drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains, not too far from here. And he said to the colonists that they no longer had the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonists. They wanted access to those lands. So a few years later, they wrote a letter of protest. In their letter, they accused the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. They went on in their letter to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally, 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear the only reason our founding fathers used the inclusive words all men is because they had a very narrow definition of who was and who was not human. Now, a few years later, oh, so this, of course, makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically racist document that assumes the dehumanization of indigenous peoples. A few years later, our founding fathers wrote another document. This document, they began with the words, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves our and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. This, of course, is the preamble to the United States Constitution. Just a few lines later, Article 1, Section 2, 
The section that refers to who, that defines who we the people actually refers to, who this Constitution was written to protect, we have to notice a few things. First of all, it never mentions women. Second, it specifically excludes natives. And third, it counts African people as three-fifths of a person. So very clearly, the Constitution of the United States was written with the express intent of protecting the rights of white landowning men of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to white landowning men and white landowning men's posterity, we do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. We have to remind ourselves the Constitution was literally written to protect the interests and the rights of white landowning men. So we have to stop being surprised that women earn 70 cents to the dollar. The Constitution's working. We have to stop being shocked that our prisons are filled with people of color. The Constitution's working. We have to not be surprised when what happened in 2010 when the United States Supreme Court sided with Citizens United and said that, and said that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. The Constitution is doing what it was designed to do, which is protect the rights of white landowning men. Now maybe you're thinking, wait, didn't we correct that? Well, about 100 years later, we passed the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment extended the right of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of government. However, this amendment did not give women the right to vote. Women didn't get that right until 1920 with women's suffrage. It did not include natives. And even after we became citizens in 1924, many of our people did not get the right to vote until 1948. So while the 14th Amendment extended the right of citizenship to a few former male slaves, it still left huge sections of our population disenfranchised and did not even extend the full right of citizenship even to former male slaves. And we often forget that it was in 1973, the same amendment, the 14th Amendment, was referenced by the United States Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade. And now it concluded unborn babies weren't fully human, and therefore they could be aborted. What this demonstrates is that the heart of the Constitution is not a value for life, but a practice of dehumanization with a value for exploitation and profit. So this, of course, makes the Constitution of the United States a systemically racist document that assumes the dominant has the authority to decide who is and who is not human. In 1823, there was a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. This is two men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe, the other one got the land from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had to decide the principle upon which land titles were based. They determined the principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subject or by whose authority was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession. They went on to state that based on the doctrine of discovery, natives, who were here first, but were less than human, only had the right of occupancy to the land, like a fish occupies water or a bird occupies air, while Europeans had the right of discovery to the land and therefore the true title to it. So this court case created a Supreme Court case precedent for land titles, along with a few other cases during the same martial court era. Now, this precedent and the doctrine of discovery were referenced by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005. So this, of course, makes the United States Supreme Court a systemically racist court that literally has legal precedent based on the dehumanization of people of color. Now, initially, the Protestant church 
pushed back against the doctrine of discovery. They didn't fully buy into it. This was a Catholic doctrine. The Protestant church didn't fully buy into it. However, in 1630, John Winthrop was in a boat in the Boston Harbor. He had just crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They were about ready to settle or to set the Boston colony. And he preached a sermon in that boat called The Model of Christian Charity. In this sermon, he referred to the colonists that he was with as a city on a hill. You should recognize this phrase because our politicians use it all the time to refer to the United States of America. He's actually borrowing from the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus tells his disciples, his followers, to be a city on a hill, a light on a stand, shining their good deeds into a dark world. He goes on in his sermon to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, to keep the unity of the Spirit all in the bond of peace. These are actually not bad exhortations, just basic Christian exhortations. However, at the end of his sermon, he begins quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is the, is the passage in the Bible where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River and they're about ready to go in and take possession of their promised land. As they're standing there, Moses, their leader, begins reiterating the threats and promises of their land covenant with God. If you obey me, I will do this to you. If you disobey me, I will do these things. At the end of this passage, it says, But if our hearts shall turn away, so that we will not obey and worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river. But in his sermon, John Winthrop says vast sea. Why do you think he said vast sea? Well, they didn't cross the river. They crossed an ocean. So what is he implying here? That based on the exhortations of Jesus, and based on the model of Old Testament Israel, they are literally at the shores of their promised land, about ready to take possession of them. Now, if you've ever read the book of Joshua in the Bible, God's command to the people of Israel in Joshua is to literally wipe out, to kill everybody in Canaan, in their promised land. Promised land for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. The birth of this belief that we are somehow unique and different on the face of this earth as Americans. Now this idea percolates for about a hundred years. In the mid-1700s, our nation begins expanding westward. We go past the Appalachian Mountains, we go past the Mississippi River, and we begin moving further and further west. As we're moving west, the Second Great Awakening begins happening. There's this rebirth of churches, there's a renewal of denominationalism, and this creates this almost religious fervor as our nation moves further and further west across the continent. And then in the early 1800s, the term manifest destiny is born. This belief that this nation had the God-given, the God-ordained right to rule this continent from sea to shining sea. So now that we have this systemically racist Declaration of Independence, a systemically racist Constitution, a systemically racist Supreme Court, and we have a manifest destiny to commit genocide across this continent, now we have a bunch of history we've never talked about. So about a year ago, I had to do some uh, write an uh, uh, article on the United States history with war and the doctrine of discovery. And I sat down and I did some research and I mapped out from 1775 to 2016. I colored in blue every year that I found our nation was in a state of war or armed military conflict against another national entity. I then went through and colored in red every year that we were in war against native peoples. So you can see the whole first half of our existence, almost the first two-thirds of our existence, we were in a nearly constant state of war against Native Americans. The list of those wars are down below. This is the 19th century. This is the century our history books refer to as our century of expansion. 
This is the century that we added 30 states into the Union. But clearly this was not a century of expansion. This was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It was during this century that in 1830 we passed the Indian Removal Act. This was the act of Congress that allowed the U.S. military, in practice by force, to remove native tribes from their lands here in the east to more empty lands further in the west. This is literally the act of Congress that allowed for the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, and the Cherokee people. All told, dozens of tribes experienced forced relocations, and tens of thousands of people died as a, as a direct result of this act. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. This was a massacre, there was about 150 to 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho people in an encampment in Colorado. They were waving a white flag of surrender and a U.S. flag, and a U.S. Army came over the hill, and a Methodist minister who was leading that army ordered all of these people slaughtered. The army went through and literally killed everybody. And later there were reports that they actually paraded their genitalia down the streets of Denver. In 1879, we had the start of the Indian boarding schools. The first boarding school in our nation was uh, founded in Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The stated goal of these schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. Native children were taken by force from their homes, enrolled in these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages. They were punished for practicing their culture. They were forced to assimilate to Western European culture. And the, the accounts of abuse, physical, sexual, verbal, and mental, just abound out of these schools. The last of these schools, many of which were run by churches, the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 1980s. In 1887, we had the Dawes Act. This was an act of Congress, so after the U.S. had moved westward, after we had had this expansion, they still wanted to open up more of the Indian lands for white, white settlement. And so what the Dawes Act did is it gave 140 acres to every male native over the age of 18. What this did is this reduced the amount of native lands, of lands killed by native tribes, by almost two-thirds, a land mass roughly the size of California. And what happened is we have what now are called checkerboard areas. So I was up in Minnesota, and there's a, 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 a reservation up there, the Fond du Lac Indian Reservation, and in the middle of the reservation there's a lake. It's just called Big Lake. I think there's so many lakes in Minnesota they've got tired of naming them all. So this is Big Lake. And Around the lake, on one side of the lake, there's a Native American camp area. There's powwow grounds, and there's a few other sacred or uh, traditional sites around there. But about two-thirds of the lake are all houses. And most of the houses are owned by non-Natives. And when I was there with an elder from that tribe, I asked him about it. I said, how can you have so many non-Natives living around your lake in the middle of your reservation? He said, that's the Dawes Act. When they opened up the land for white settlement, they gave the best lands, the most choice lands, to the white settlers, even in the middle of our reservation. And they moved us to other lands further away. In 1890, we had one of the more famous massacres of our nation's history. This was the massacre at Wounded Knee. About 350 warriors were massacred in a single day at Wounded Knee. More people know about this battle. What we don't talk about is that the United States government gave 20 Congressional Medals of Honor to the U.S. soldiers who participated in this battle, which could very easily, this battle has often been compared to a war crime. And yet our government gave 20 Congressional Medals of Honor, and every effort to have these medals rescinded has been rebuffed. I actually found a quote by Senator John McCain in a newspaper in the U.K advocating against the rescindment of these medals. On December 19, 2009, Congress passed House Resolution 3326. This was the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. 
This is uh, the, the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. It's a 67-page document laying out the budget. Page 45, subsection 8113, is titled Apology to Native People of the United States. What follows is this seven bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. It basically says you have some nice land. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's just call it all of our land and steward it together. This Paul even ends with a disclaimer stating nothing in here is legally binding. To date, this apology has never been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. Our nation teaches a mythology. We don't teach American history. We teach the American mythology. And in our mythology, we have a bunch of code words. So our code words are discovery, equality, expansion, and exceptionalism. The myth says that we have liberty and justice for everyone. Now, I moved to D.C. about a year ago. And I've been living there with my family. And last year, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I wanted to go to the Lincoln Memorial. This was a space in our nation that is a safe space for people of color. This is a space where we've had a lot of national dialogues about race, about equality, about our nation's history. A lot of these conversations have taken place on the steps of this memorial. And President Lincoln is one of our, civil, our, one of our human rights heroes because of what he did with freeing the slaves. Who's ever been to the Lincoln Memorial? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Who's been to the museum at the base of the Lincoln Memorial? Okay, there's a small museum at the base of the Lincoln Memorial. It's about the size of a, of a classroom. On each wall is different writings and different statements and different uh, aspects of President Lincoln's legacy or of his writings. On one wall is a, a, a wall containing writing about his beliefs about the Union. On that wall, on a stone plaque or stone tablet, about maybe four feet tall and two and a half feet wide, is this statement. It says, I would save the Union. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Lincoln Memorial. In the Lincoln Memorial, at the base of, of the memorial, in a museum, is a plaque that literally states, according to Abraham Lincoln, black lives don't matter. It's hanging right there. This is the mythology of our nation. This is the lies we tell ourselves. Our mythology has all of these code words. We use discovery instead of dehumanization. We talk about equality without mentioning it's only for a very select few. We use expansion instead of ethnic cleansing. We use exceptionalism in place of genocide. And we don't mention that our liberty and justice are only for a very narrowly defined few. This is the history that we teach. This is the mythology of our nation that we've worked very carefully over the past 500 years to construct. Now there's a leader, Aboriginal leader out of Canada, his name is George Erasmus. And George Erasmus says, what common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where communities to be formed, common memory must be created. I think this quote gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we don't have a common memory. We have a dominant culture that remembers a history of discovery, expansion, opportunity, and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color that have the lived experience 
of stolen lands, broken treaties, slavery, ethnic cleansing, genocide, Jim Crow laws, segregation, mass incarceration, internment camps, boarding schools, and everything else that we've done as a nation. We have no common memory. And I'm convinced this is one of the reasons why we have so many problems with race in our country, because we don't know how to talk about these things. We don't know how to teach this history. Now, many nations around the country have similar problems. And they've worked hard to wrestle with these problems. Many nations have had what are called Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. South Africa had one after the fall of apartheid. Rwanda had one after a civil war. Canada just finished one in response to a, a lawsuit brought by boarding school survivors um, against the government and the churches for the residential schools they had there. I believe for a number of years that our nation needs something along the lines of a truth, a national dialogue on race, like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we've seen in other countries. But again, we have to remember we live in this nation that has this carefully constructed myth or house of cards. And so one of the myths that we use, who's heard of this term? Racial reconciliation. This is a beautiful term, right? Let's bring harmony back into our races. Well, I don't deny it's a beautiful term, but it's a myth. This term is a misnomer. It, it doesn't make any sense when you understand our history. Race is a human construct. There's no genetic definition of race. We have the human race. We don't have races. So race is a human construct, and in America it was constructed for the purpose of dividing and oppressing. So one of the ways we constructed the black race here in America was with the one drop rule. The one drop rule stated that if you had a single drop of African blood in you, you were black and you could be a slave. Why do we have this rule? Well, because slaves were our labor force. We need as many as possible. The one drop rule allowed a white slave owner to rape one of his female slaves and produce baby slaves. That's how we constructed that race. The American Indian race was constructed partially using the blood quantum rule. The blood quantum rule states your full, half, quarter, 16, 30 seconds, 64th, then you're bred out of existence. Why do we have that rule? Well, the mythology of America is that this land was empty. We discovered it. There was no one here. So we constructed the Indian race to breathe them out of existence. So we wouldn't have to deal with them. So race in America was constructed for the purpose of dividing and oppressing. Reconciliation implies a previous harmony. You're reconciling, you're reconciling the relationship. You're going back to a point of previous harmony or beauty in the relationship. So it's a complete misnomer. There was no, there was never racial conciliation. So there can't be racial reconciliation. There was no harmony we're going back to. So about nine months ago, I actually quit using the term racial reconciliation, and I began using the term racial conciliation. Conciliation is really the mediation of a dispute. Reconciliation lets us perpetuate the myth. We used to be great, things used to be good, there was much harmony here, and now it's all falling apart. That's the myth. Racial conciliation allows us to start the dialogue at a much more honest place. You know, this thing started out jacked up, and we're just trying to bring it to a healthier or to a better place. We're trying to bring conciliation, trying to mediate a dispute. We're not trying to regain some mythical harmony that used to exist here. So as I've been thinking about these issues of our people and of our nation and of our country and of our races for the past 15 years, I've come to the conclusion that the United States of America needs a national truth and conciliation commission. And by the way things are going nationally, we need to have this dialogue sooner rather than later. Things are beginning to fall apart at the scene. 
we don't quite know what to do. Our leaders are flabbergasted. They don't know how to handle this. They don't know what to do with the racial tension that is beginning to explode into every segment of our society. And so we need a National Truth and Conciliation Commission, and I'm aiming to have one in 2021, five years from now. So that begs the question, how do you start a dialogue like this? How do you force a nation to have a dialogue that it clearly doesn't want to have? We've never known how to talk about race. Who's learned something new tonight? We don't teach this history. We don't, we don't know how to talk about these things. How are we going to start that dialogue? Well, most truth and reconciliation commissions are born out of a period of crisis. So in South Africa, apartheid fell. That crisis was enough to bring the parties to the table to have truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, there was this bloody civil war. That crisis was enough to bring the parties to the table to talk about truth and reconciliation. In Canada, there was a massively expensive lawsuit. It nearly bankrupted the churches and it scared the crap out of the government so much that they came to the table and settled the lawsuit and agreed to have a National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, we just celebrated the 15th anniversary of 9-11. 15 years ago, we were attacked on our soil, and we have literally been at war with terrorism, with Muslims, and with the Middle East for 15 years. Our nation does not handle crisis well. We don't handle crisis well. We, we panic, we freak out, we live, go into paranoia. We do not, as a nation, we do not handle crisis well. So I don't want to wait for, I don't want to hope for, I don't want to pray for, I don't want to work for, I don't want to initiate crisis into our country because we don't handle it well. So the other way you initiate a national dialogue like this is you use a model of disruption. That's what Black Lives Matter is doing. That's actually how we got the civil rights movement. You, you disrupt the stage, you disrupt the event, you make people stop and take notice, and then you co-opt the stage and you speak your message, you interject your message into the dialogue. Now, the African American community primarily has used this method very effectively. This is the way they brought the civil rights movement to the table. Black Lives Matter is forcing our nation to have a conversation that it doesn't want to have. But as I've looked closely at the model of disruption and as the way we've used that, both in healthy ways and in detrimental ways in our country, I'm not convinced that the disruption model is going to bring the depth of dialogue we need to have. And let me help you understand why. So the strength of the disruption model is the actual act of disrupting. So someone has a stage, they have an audience, and you disrupt that stage, you co opt the stage, and you, you take it over. Now, the moment that happens, one of two things are going to take place. Either the owner of the stage is going to take it back, or the audience is going to leave, because they've come to hear you. So literally, all you have is a sound bite. All you have is a, a moment to interject your message. And so this is, this is what, how Black Lives Matter works, and this is how the civil rights movement got started. But one of the challenges, and there's a lot of good things that came out of our civil rights movement. One of the challenges with our civil rights movement was that one of the moral authorities that we used by both sides throughout this movement was our Declaration of Independence. This was the blank check referred to by Dr. King. This was the reason white America was lining up to say, okay, let's, let's grant freedom or let's grant rights to the African Americans. We use the, the Declaration of Independence as a moral authority for why we should do this. Now I just demonstrated to you that the Declaration of Independence is actually a racist document. So instead of having the conversation that our racism actually goes down to the level of our Declaration, we basically said we have a good foundation, 
We just have to be better Americans. So instead of attacking and challenging the implicit racial bias of America, we actually ended up affirming American exceptionalism. Now I'm convinced this is one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter is happening today. Because we've actually never had the dialogue that our foundations literally state Black Lives Don't Matter. That's the dialogue we have to have. But we've never gotten to that point. So then, so if crisis isn't going to work, disruption's not going to work, what's the third way to do it? Well, if you watch the primary election this season, our nation did something that has not happened in a long time, which is we had a candidate running this past year who actually got our nation to talk about some of its systemic problems. Who was that candidate? Bernie, right? He ran, at the heart of his campaign, was our systemically corrupt and divisive and, and um, unfair economic policy. That was the heart of his campaign. He sounded like a broken record for the first few months of his campaign. But he used the campaign as a way to introduce a dialogue. He wasn't co-opting the stage. He wasn't just giving a sound bite. He was a part of the conversation, and he was forcing the other candidates to respond to his issues. It was being discussed in the debates. Reporters were asking questions about it. Writers were writing about it. He was introducing a dialogue into our nation about our systemic economic inequalities in our nation. And he changed the dialogue. Now, he didn't win, the, he didn't win the, the campaign, but he deeply affected, he deeply changed the dialogue because he actually used the process that we have in our nation to decide who we are and where we're going. And that's every four years in our national presidential election, we allow people to say, here's what I think our problems are, and here's what I think we need to do about them. Bernie Sanders was the only candidate who actually ever campaigned, who campaigned this last campaign to Native peoples. And that's because you cannot campaign to Native peoples without acknowledging there's a systemic problem. He excited a whole generation of, of citizens and of voters who got behind him and got on board and he helped change the dialogue. He helped shape the platform of the Democratic Party this year. He affected the platform of the Republican Party because he used one of the structures that we have to actually introduce the dialogue. So I'm convinced this is going to be the best way for our nation to ever deal with race. Now, about four years, about, not three, about nine months ago, President Obama was talking in his final State of the Union. And in his speech, he was talking about our need for a new politics. We need a new politics in the country, he was saying. And he actually quoted the Constitution. And he said, we the people. We've come to, a, to determine that means all of us. That means everyone. I heard him say that, and I thought, really? I didn't get that memo. Like, that sounds nice. It sounds beautiful. But I never, I never saw our nation come to a point where we've actually concluded we the people actually means all of us. In fact, that seems to be the debate we're having this election season. Correct? Bernie, San uh, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump has a pretty clear idea of who the we the people includes. It doesn't include Muslims. It doesn't include the immigrants from the South. It doesn't include women. And based on the amount of money he's made buying and selling land in this country, it doesn't include natives. Donald Trump has a very clear definition of who we the people mean. The challenge with Donald Trump that I see is he actually understands what made America great which is explicit and systemic racism. And he's not afraid to voice that and to bring that back into the dialogue. Now the problem is Hillary Clinton is not his antithesis. Donald Trump is saying what? Make America great again. What is Hillary saying? America's great already. We've always been great. 
So what do they agree on? Our history, our foundations are great. At the Democratic National Convention, Cory Booker, an African-American senator from New Jersey, he got on stage and he actually acknowledged, he actually acknowledged the term savages in the Declaration. He acknowledged the Three-Fifths Compromise in the Constitution. But he bookended those words by stating our foundations were our genius and our founders are great. Like, you, you can't say that. You can't identify something as racist and then call it great unless your definition of racism is great. You can't, otherwise you can't, you can't do it that way. So the conversation we're having this election season, it's not a racist, anti-racist dialogue. It's an explicit racism versus an implicit racism dialogue. That's the conversation we're having in our country. And that's the conversation that's freaking everybody out because we've actually, since the civil rights movement, we've actually grown very accustomed to having racism be our implicit bias. We've gotten uncomfortable with our explicit manifestations of racism and got much more comfortable with our implicit manifestations of racism. But it's the presidential campaign that is actually going to change the conversation. So what I'm looking for, what I would love to see is that we have a candidate in the next election, which begins in 2018, after the midterm election, who can run with the issue of race, the brokenness of the foundations of our country, and the vision for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission at the heart of their platform. Just like Bernie Sanders did with the economy, I want to have someone there running with that platform about race. We have to talk about this. We have to talk about that. Our foundations are what's broken. Our foundations are what's messed up. Our foundations are what is making us systemically racist. And then I want to use that to introduce the dialogue into the broader discussion. Now, to give that dialogue the best hope of being traction, there's three audiences I want primarily to engage with. The first audience is the church. The church wrote the Doctrine of Discovery. The church has been complicit in the Doctrine of Discovery for 500 years. The church needs to own what it has done. The church needs to recognize that this is the foundation that's laid for our nation and needs to own its complicity in this Doctrine of Discovery. And the tool the church has to deal with this sin is the tool of lament, the tool of mourning, the tool of just sitting before God and acknowledging the deep problems it's caused so that God can, can lead them and move forward into a better path. So that's one of my well, that's one of my audiences I'm trying to engage with, is I'm trying to engage the church and to call the church into what I'm calling a seasonable men. I actually gave a presentation to uh, some of the Christian groups on campus last night that was specifically centered around this message, message of the men. The second group I want to interact with is Native people. Here's my message for our Native peoples. One of the challenges with, well, let me go back. So about 12 years ago, I was pastoring a church in Denver, and I, I felt like it would be a good step to move actually back to the reservation where I grew, where my family is from. I grew up in the border town of the Navajo Reservation. I was pastoring a, a primarily Native American church in Denver. And I wanted to move back to our reservation. And so we actually moved back to a very traditional area of the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. For three years, we lived in this very remote um, sheep camp. We were six miles off the nearest paved road on a dirt road. We lived with a family that wove rubs and herded sheep for a living. And there was no running water, no electricity in that community. We lived there for three years, and then we moved into a, a, a small village still on the reservation, but wasn't quite so far off the grid and we lived there for another eight years. Now, we moved back there completely prepared for living off the grid, hauling our water, living by candlelight, all the things that go about that. Most of the people my age from our reservation, they either grew up that way or they spent their summers that way. To this day, about a quarter of our people still live that way. Um, so early 2000, 2002, we moved back there, and we were prepared to live this way. What completely caught me off guard was how marginalized I felt. 
I literally felt like I dropped off the face of the earth. I was living with our people, dealing with our historical trauma, dealing with the marginalization, the oppression of our people, and I was having a hard time talking about it. Every time I would talk with one of my non-native friends about what I was experiencing, I would get angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier, and soon I'd either have to start yelling or hang up the phone. So I began to temper myself and disconnect emotionally, and then I could stay in the dialogue longer, but then I saw the defenses of my friends going up. That was my people who stole your land, that was my people who did these things, and soon they would have to shut down or hang up the phone because they were so defensive about the conversation. So one day I was writing a letter to some friends of mine for like the tenth time, trying to get them to understand what I was experiencing emotionally. And I said to them, I said, being Native American and living in the United States, it feels like our Native people have this old grandmother who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food, they're having a party inside our house. They've since come upstairs and unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later. We're tired, we're old, we're weak, and we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, the thing that causes us the most pain, is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and simply says thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I started sharing that, and immediately I'm like, that's what I feel. That's what it is. I started sharing that with other natives, and they said, I've lived on the reservation all my life. I've never been able to articulate how I felt. You hit the nail on the head. I shared it with other non-natives, and they would come up and say, what does it look like to say thank you? Now we're having a very different dialogue. Now we're not talking about victim and oppressor. Now we're talking about this reversal of roles. One of the biggest challenges we have as a nation is that we have this massive reversal of roles. We have 300 million undocumented immigrants living in this land acting like they own the place. We have 6 million indigenous people living here and acting like unwanted guests in someone else's house. We have to find a way to reverse those roles. My message to my native peoples is you are not the helpless victims. We are not the helpless victims of an oppressive colonial government. We are the host people of the land, and we have to begin acting that way. We have to be conducting ourselves as the host of this land. That's my message to Native people. My third message is to communities of color, Africans, Latinos, Hispanics, Natives, other communities of color. My message to these people, so I want to take you through a little bit of psychology here. Who knows the term PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder. This is an individual diagnosis that deals with a person who's experienced, witnessed, or somehow been affected by violence. So this is what you, the way you, you um, refer to someone who's experienced violence in some way or in some form or another. Now historical trauma, I refer to historical trauma as a multi-generational, communal expression or manifestation of PTSD. So historical trauma is not an individual diagnosis. You don't diagnose that person with historical trauma. Historical trauma is how you understand the broader dissatisfaction of an entire community that's somehow been oppressed or victimized in some way, shape, or form. So historical trauma is the multi-generational, communal manifestation of PTSD. Now, there's another type of trauma that's being researched, and that trauma is called perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Perpetration-induced traumatic stress is like PTSD in every way, shape, and form, except instead of, it, of affecting the person who's experienced or been affected by or, or witnessed the violence, 
Pit affects the person who perpetrated the violence. The person who caused the violence. So Socrates expresses this when he says, the doer of injustice is more miserable than the sufferer. So if we have PTSD mapping generally over to historical trauma on the multi-generational communal level, I'm hypothesizing that PITS also has a multi-generational communal expression. So when we talk about the doctrine of discovery, it's very easy to see the historical trauma that affects or inflicts Native communities, African American communities, other communities of color. You can see the historical trauma of our communities that come out of this history of the doctrine of discovery. But what I say to people is that you cannot build a nation on 500 years of dehumanizing injustice without traumatizing yourself. So I identify white America as another traumatized group of people. Not victims, but traumatized by his, their own historic actions and the privilege and the benefits that they currently receive from those actions. So one of the first symptoms of trauma is denial. It's one of the first ways, one of the first symptoms you look for in a trauma patient is a symptom of denial. So if you understand our dominant culture, white America, as a traumatized group of people, it's easy to see their symptoms. So this very apology in the appropriations bill, that's not racism, that's trauma. Our congressmen were so overwhelmed by what they did, what their nation did on their behalf, they couldn't even read it out loud, they couldn't even acknowledge it. We have states like Texas and Oklahoma passing laws that you can only teach patriotic history. That's not racism, that's trauma. These states are so overwhelmed by what they did to become who they are, they can't even teach that history anymore. We use, in our civil rights movement, the Declaration of Independence as a moral authority. Again, we ended up affirming American exceptionalism instead of dealing with our implicit bias. So American exceptionalism is actually one of the coping mechanisms for a nation that's in deep denial of its genocidal past and its current racist reality. This is how our nation uses American exceptionalism. This, this justifies our past. It's, it's our coping mechanism. It's one other way that we keep ourselves in a state of denial. Now, when we deal with trauma patients, people who have traumatized, they have triggers. A trigger is something that takes you out of reality and puts you back into the chaos of the moment of the traumatic event. So once we understand white America as a traumatized group of people, it's easy to see their triggers. So seven years of a black president, it's a trigger takes us out of reality into this chaotic political turmoil we're in right now. Any sort of national dialogue on gun control is a trigger. We can't have that dialogue nationally and publicly without screaming at one another. I have to identify ISIS as a trigger. Now why is ISIS a trigger? Well, they're a group of religious zealots ethnically cleansing a land to set up their own pseudo-religious empire. Who's the someone? I mean, that's us. That reflection is so familiar, it absolutely freaks us out. This is why Paris gets bombed, and somehow it's all about us. We don't know what to do with that. If CNN and the United Nations had existed 150, 175 years ago, the reputation of the United States is no better than ISIS. The 19th century was a period of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Terrorism freaks us out, because that reflection is way too familiar. Now, I'm not trying to convince white Americans that they're traumatized. I'm trying to convince people of color that white Americans traumatized. Why? Well, as people of color, we know we're traumatized. We know we're messed up. Right? I lived on our reservation for over a decade. 
I know that it's trouble following my people. I know when I talk to my people, I have to take into account our trauma. I live now in Trinidad, one of, one of the more impoverished neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. We know in the African American community that there's trauma. We know our communities are struggling and having problems because of our history. The challenge is, is as communities of color, while we know we're traumatized, we tend to think white America came out of this history unscathed. And therefore, we have this expectation that somehow they can fix it. Now, the problem is, is white America does not have the tools in its corporate collective tool belt to fix the problem. So what does white America bring to the table to fix the problem? Well, one thing it brings is money. It's all blood money. It's all based on stolen property. It's not going to fix the problem. The other thing white America, as a corporate identity, brings to the table is its own understanding of liberty and justice and freedom, which their own foundational documents define exist only for a very narrow few. White America can't fix it. Now, I have a seven-year-old daughter. She could crash my car, pull the parking brake out, let her roll down the hill, and ram into a tree at the base of our hill. I can scream her all I want, but she can't fix it. Screaming at my daughter would only frustrate me and paralyze her. Is there a way I can get her involved in the process of fixing it? Yes. Can I ask her to fix it? No. So again, I'm trying to convince people of color that when we deal with white America, we're dealing with another group of traumatized people. And we have to take that into account when we interact with them. There's this great conversation by Socrates with Polis. And it says, is it not a fact that injustice and the doing of injustice is the greatest of evil? Polis says, yes, that's quite clear. Socrates goes on, and further, that to suffer punishment is the way to be released from this evil. Paul says, true. And not to suffer is to perpetuate the evil. Yes. To do wrong, then, is second only in the scale of evils, but to do wrong and not be punished is first and greatest of all. That is true. Well, and was not this my point in dispute, my friend, you deem Archelaus happy because he was a very great criminal and unpunished. On the other hand, I on the other hand maintain that he or any other like him has done wrong, who has done wrong and has not been punished, is and ought to be the most miserable of all men. And that the doer of injustice is more miserable than the sufferer, and he who escapes punishment more miserable than, his, than he who suffers. Was that what I said? Yes. One of the challenges with our nation is that we've never lost a war that matters. We've never lost a war that matters. We've never had to, under the, the shame and scorn of the global community, turn around, look back, and say we probably shouldn't have done that. What happened after World War II to Germany? What they did? They started teaching the Holocaust. Why? So they could do it better next time? No, so they would never do it again. What did Japan do after World War II? They dropped their military. They disarmed. What did we do after we dropped a nuclear bomb killing tens of thousands of Japanese people in a single instant? We ramped up our nuclear arsenal. We've never lost a war that mattered. We've never had to turn around as a nation, look back on our history, and say we probably shouldn't have done that. Because of that, we've allowed ourselves to control the narrative. So the narrative of America is we are the good guys. We have the moral high ground. We are the ones who love liberty, justice, and freedom. But we've never actually had to put the fruits of our injustice on the table. Because we've won every war, we've never lost a war that really mattered. 
And that's the struggle of America. That's the struggle of our nation, is we want to be the moral authorities, the moral leaders of the world, but we don't want to put the fruits of our injustice on the table. And we've never had to. And that's the dilemma, and that's what I'm trying to bring about with this conversation. That's what I'm saying is Socrates is saying here. Because we maintain the moral high ground and we have the fruits of our injustice, it's actually driving us crazy. We don't know how to deal with that. We don't know how to handle it. And so we have to we have to have a decision. We have to have a dialogue about our history, about what we've done, and what are we going to do about it. We can't continue to maintain the moral high ground and live off the fruits of our injustice. We have to find a way to actually begin to reconcile some of these things. And so this goes back to what we need. We need to have a way to talk about our history. We need to have a way to talk about our past. We need to have a way to deal with what we've done how we've got to where we're at. And we have to own up to it. And we, we don't know how to do that. This is why we struggle so incredibly hard to talk about race. This is why the two leaders we have running for president are absolutely clueless and don't know what to do about these shootings. Because they are both running around advocating at the top of, our, of their lungs that our history is great and our foundations are genius. And you can't hold that belief and acknowledge we have deep systemic problems. We treat our founding documents like they're God-inspired divine texts. And they're not. They are deeply flawed, narrow-minded documents that were written out of a worldview that developed from the doctrine of discovery that assumed people of color are less than human. You're not going to change that with a simple amendment. You're not going to change that with tweaking a few laws or voting in a new judge. That's not going to fix the problem. We have to go back and deal with our foundations and the intent they were written with. And then we have to collectively decide as a nation, do we want to have the moral high ground or do we want to risk and put at risk the fruits of our injustice. Do we want to own what we've done, or do we want to keep the fruits of our injustice? We can't do them both. It's going to drive us crazy. So this is what I'm working for. This is the best thinking I've been able to have. This has come out of hours and hours of dialogue, reflection, prayer, discussion, conversation, reading, research, everything I've done. And now I'm literally going around the nation trying to convince our people we have to find a way to talk about these things. Until we do, the two shootings we had in the last 36 hours, the muted response by our leaders, the anger, the fear, the frustration, the panic that we feel around our nation, the frustration, it's only going to continue to grow until we can find a way to talk about it. But two years ago, almost, I wrote one of my first articles about the Doctrine of Discovery. I called it The Doctrine of Discovery, a very apology and an empty chair. Back then, I was labeling what I was working towards as a truth commission. I've since incorporated the words truth and conciliation commission. But it, it lays out my vision of where I think we need to go as a nation and how we need to deal with this history. Um, my articles are on my website, which is wirelesshogarm.com. We're actually in the process of revamping the web website, so it should be, um, a new version will be up in a few weeks. And then on all social media, um, these three as well as many others, I use the username Wireless Hogarm. So um, I thank you very much for having me in, for listening to me today. I thank you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and hear this lecture. And I deeply invite you to find ways to engage this dialogue and talk about our history. So thank you very, very much.